the ultimate post pub movie that you, know, you and your mates come back from the pub having had a few sit down and watch it and it just like it hits all the marks for that I, I don't even think he's specified as being SAS he's he's some other unit that you never really told Sean said, yeah, what, if I, what if I throw it away so it's so fetch? I was just like, I love it. Something big. Yeah. Yeah. Neil, how are you, sir? I'm good. Not Which too bad, guys. Glad to be back in the UK. Yes, yes. We were just saying, weren't we? You're filming your new um, production, The Lair. Yeah. Just from the little bit that I read. Is it a, a, is, did I get it right? A female fighter pilot shot down in Afghanistan? Yes. There's a, uh, so a, a female RAF pilot shot down in Afghanistan. Hooked up with some US soldiers are there. And they, they've also, there's also some SAS guys who are in the neighbourhood and uh, end up having to do battle with this former Russian science experiment that's come back to life. It's oh. very much in the kind of the, the school, like it's, it's like a sort of sister film to Dog Soldiers, I suppose, or a brother yes. film. Um, soldiers and Monsters. Um, and just having a lot of fun with that. Yeah, I bet. I wanted to ask you... Um, um, First off, should we just say a massive thank you to Mark Ryan, who's been um Absolutely. I was gonna say, like it's 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 brilliant of Mark to put us in touch. Um Mark is a very, very good friend. I, I was lucky enough to work with him on uh, first on Black Sales. Uh having been a fan of his for years and years, from Who Does Wins to Robert Sherwood and such like, uh, to get to work with him on Black Sales and then we worked together again a couple of years back on uh, the reckoning as well. Yes, my my son just refers to Mark as Bumblebee. <laughs> I guess that's, that's how the new generation know him. But for us, he'll always be Nazir. Yes, yes, of course. And how is it for the new generation then that do many of them pick up on dog soldiers? Dog soldiers just seems to be like sort of an, an eternally kind of loved movie. I mean, I I I I, I don't necessarily know that many of the new generation but it's constantly being asked about and constantly being the big question being is like is there going to be a dog even 20 years later is there going to be a dog soldiers sequel um so the seems you know, the interest and in, uh, love for the film um and affection for the movie just, just seems to keep on going which is lovely you know to have created something that people like so much you know yes exactly um to, to, to have a film that becomes a cult classic just must be a writer and director's dream. Well, it is. You don't plan for that. You know, I, you know, I just planned. I kind of threw everything in with the kitchen sink when I was making it. It was my first feature and had a whole bunch of ideas and threw all sorts of things in there and a lot of them stuck. And um, I always just imagined it as being like sort of I wanted it to be like the ultimate post pub movie that you, know, you and your mates come back from the pub haven't had a few sit down and watch it and it just like it hits all the marks for that and i guess that still stands you know as long as people are still going to pubs and you know on friday night or whatever and you and your mates want to sit down and watch a movie that's the perfect movie for it yes it's the classic line in the whole film is uh Sean Pertwee, who plays Wet Wells, isn't it? Yeah. And he goes to grab a weapon, and it's a stick. And he, and he says to the werewolf, fetch. <laughs> 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 That's, um, yeah, I, I, reckon that, I reckon that touched, a, a, touched a, the funny bone of any squatty watching. I think so. Well, the thing is, there's a, there was quite a lot of... Um, improvised stuff in it and i think you know that was one of the lines that like if you know sean said yeah what if i what if i throw it away so it's so fetch i was just like i love it That's brilliant let's do it um there's there's a lot of that going on because like sean was so into his character and loved that character and 
got into the world of being a squaddy and, and uh, just so well, you know. So and they all did. I mean, by the end of the shoot, I think they all would have like fought and died for each other. They were so tight, you know. Yeah, so I bet. Um, Sean did an, uh, another really great film a few years ago. You probably might remember the name of it, um, but it was set in Cornwall. Uh, uh, Blue Juice. Blue Juice, Blue. that was right. I'll be honest, it was so long ago I watched it, I can't quite remember the plot, but I just remember it being... Um, well, it's the, it's, the, it's the Cornwall equivalent of Point Break, I suppose. <laughs> It's the, the the ultimate Cornwall surfing movie, of which it comes from a uh, you know a genre of one. Yes, <laughs> and there's quite a lot of humour in it as well. Yeah, it's great. I, it was because of films like that that I, I knew I wanted to work with Sean on Dog Soldiers. Was like I, I I just thought he had such charisma, you know. Yes, yes, and he's a Cornish boy, isn't he? I think he is originally. Yeah, I'm 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 just going on the accent alone. It's it's um, it's funny. I've just been in. I've spent quite a lot in time in Cornwall um, this summer, and uh, the Cornish do have a certain look to them. Not just. I mean, there is a big sort of surfer look thing going on down there. But um, Sean reminds me so much of one of the guys I was in the Marines with. It's just, uh, yeah, it's almost a bit surreal. But well, he's got a great face. It's kind of. It's very lived in, it's very weathered, it's very full of character. Yes. So, um, wh- when you brought the SAS bit into the forest there, which is the heart or the, the highlands, in, not the highlands, but the woods in Scotland. Yeah. Which was filmed in Luxembourg, right? Yeah, we did do a couple of days filming in Scotland just for the, the bigger shots and just to help establish it. Because Luxembourg was okay for forests and things like that, but it doesn't really look like Scotland aside from that. Is is that a difficult thing to get over, or is it sort of in? It, it, I um, mean, bear, bear in mind, most people have probably never been to a Scottish forest, so they wouldn't. Might true. Not. Well, it's, uh, I mean, it's full of like pine forests and stuff like that, which Scotland also has a lot of. Um, but when it comes to mountains and things like that, there's nothing like that in Luxembourg. So anything that had mountains in it, whatever, was 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 Scotland. All the aerial stuff was Scotland. But yeah, you, you just, I mean, so many of my films are like that, that you you shoot a few days like somewhere really exotic and then the rest is done somewhere, you know, uh, pretty close to home. I mean, Centurion's a good example because we shot a week in Scotland, but all the rest was shot in Surrey just outside London. But you'd never know that to watch the movie. That's another one of... Um uh, the all-time classic film Centurion. That was a what was that a, a, a Roman team of Romans trapped behind enemy lines yeah. in, in a, a lot. A lot of the movies that I've done have come from very drunken conversations in pubs. Um, Dog soldiers just kind of originated around a table in a pub one day, I think. And Centurion was the same. Was that a friend of mine uh, told me about this this the legend of the Ninth Legion about this uh, legion of Roman soldiers that marched into the misty Scottish mountains and vanished without a trace. And that just immediately like piqued my interest. I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's cool. But also like, cause that where I grew up in Newcastle, right next to Hadrian's wall, um, you know, Romans, uh, the Roman history is kind of a big part of my growing up. So, this notion of like a a, a legion of, of Romans marching through the wall and up into Scotland and then never coming back was like, okay, this this is really fascinating, even if it's not entirely true, because like the myth's been disproved since then. But it's it's that old saying was that um, you know when the legend becomes truth, print the legend. Um, the, the, the myth was way more interesting than the truth, so I went with that. But yeah. So going back in history, then. Did I get this right? Did the Romans met their sort of nemesis with, with taking on the tribes of Scotland and got their ass a bit kicked? They did. Um, they couldn't defeat um, the Picts in Scotland. I mean, that's why they built Hedrin's Wall, which is a pretty excessive thing to do. So it kind of makes you think that whatever was up there was pretty terrifying to them that they built this enormous wall right across the country to prevent them invading. It's like, wow, they were really scared. So <laughs> that makes the pics sound pretty terrifying. 
Yes, plus I'm thinking from a military point of view, you've got these boys from the Mediterranean in their skirts. And well, ex exactly. And then they're suddenly in the Scottish climate. Yeah, and and wonder, and and of course they picked like they fought battles mostly like naked, which is like that must be pretty hardcore in the Highlands of Scotland in January as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah, going back to to the SAS thing, I wondered if that was um like a plot mechanism because obviously when the boys go on exercise, well, when the when the military goes on exercise, mm -hmm. you you're not carrying ammunition, are you? Not not real proper ammunition. No, no. Um, I, I had to, I had to take a few liberties with the film to a point, but it was the idea that the, the. I mean, I, I don't even think he's specified as being SAS. He's, he's some other unit that you never really told, or the, the um, special weapons division, um, and he's working for this group, and and you know, they're, they're, they're off there to to hunt werewolves. They just use our sold our heroes as bait. Um, you know, cannon fodder. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, you know, that whole film was designed, and I pitched it to everybody. I said, "This isn't a werewolf movie with soldiers. This is a soldier movie with werewolves." I wanted to make, uh, as like as authentic a depiction of squaddies as I'd seen in in a movie. Um, there were, you know, you see so many movies made about U.S. soldiers. There was hardly any made about British soldiers, and uh, my, you know, my granddad was in the army. My dad was in the army. Uh, I probably would have ended up in the army myself had I not gone the filmmaking route, but I, I just felt that, that that a lot of films depicted soldiers, you know, not very authentically, and I wanted to get across that humour, that camaraderie, and the professionalism about them. Um, that kind of all rolls into one, as as you well know, and um, and put them in a movie. It just happened to be about werewolves, but that just made it all the more kind of outrageous. Had any of the cast? Served in the military? Uh, no, they hadn't. Uh, we we did a little bit of training or whatever with them as best we could beforehand, but uh, yeah, none of them had actually served in the military. Mm. Did you have? There's, to no, have there's not many actors have now. <laughs> you know, it's not like the old days with uh, like David Niven and all that lot who served in World War Two, and then you know when I had careers afterwards. But um, yeah, it's this generation of actors have. have rarely read in the military and kevin mckid must have been a great um a great guy to, to get for the for the role he was i mean it was kind of hot off the back of train spotting really um but yeah kev was was well up for it fancy after doing something very very different for train spotting and you know it's also quite a, a thing that with with british actors unlike american actors who've all done cop shows and god knows what so they've all like handled firearms and things a lot of british actors haven't like had the experience of handling firearms um so that's quite a thrill for them quite a buzz for them but they all they all got really into it and we had some good training for them. we had some, we had a, we had a, this foreign legion guy out in, in luxembourg who put them through their paces before we shot the film and kev mckid actually during this training he cracked a rib um but he, he was scared that we might replace him on the film, so he didn't tell us about it until like a week into filming. Um, but he was he was in agony, but he kind of just pushed on through and then told us about it. We were like, "Well, get yourself sorted, mate. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna get rid of you, but get yourself sorted." <laughs> he had a much better uh, outcome than he did as Tommy, didn't he? Uh, he did. <laughs> yeah, he lived yeah, through yeah. this one. Uh, yeah, he was the only one who did, but uh, yeah, thankfully. Um, yeah, did you did did you sorry? Did you have military advisors? How does that work? Uh, well, so we we over in Luxembourg, there was this guy who was uh, ex French Foreign Legion, uh, and he came and, and did some training for a few days, oh, and also um, like pretty much all of the crew uh, had served in the military as well. Um, because there's still like national service over, I don't know if there still is, but there was then, but in, in Luxembourg. So um, they'd all served in the military. So so they all like were there to, you know, advise us if we were doing anything wildly wrong. But also um, I had a pretty good idea myself about a lot of stuff. So, um, you know, just everybody just pitched in. 
just to try and get it right. Yes, it's it's um, interesting because back in the day, or certainly back then, the the SA eighty was obviously a new weapon to the British Army. I think well, well it 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 been in about twelve years by the time I think the film was. Made. Yeah, and generally disliked by everybody. Yeah, so the bit where they swapped it for the MP fives or <laughs> the armor lights or whatever was um, yes. Every made a, made a lot of sense, but also, but also I think at that time I like I don't think I'd seen the SA eighty um, depicted in a, in a in a movie. I can't I can't think of any. I mean I've seen a few since, but at the time it was like oh this is kind of like a fresh weapon to see in a movie. But I say I, all all the people I talked to was like God they hated it. Like everybody hated it. Did you hate it? <sighs> While we're on the subject, it. I think it's like this. I think for some reason the British went for a British made work or a, a Enfield. I don't know if that's what, what part of Britain that is, but um, yeah, they. I think they went for like a homemade weapon to. I don't know if that's a financial thing that the money goes back into the country or whatever. Sure. And obviously, that the the, um, the uh, American armor light or the M sixteen would have been the obvious choice because it was so. It proved itself in in Vietnam. Obviously, you you hardly have to clean the thing, and it floats, and it's lightweight, and it uses the five point five six ammo. Yeah. Um, but then, having said that, the first time we held an SA eighty in in Royal Marines training, our PW, so our instructor said, "Don't listen to these old sweats that saying this is a load of shit. It's actually a really good weapon. It's just got teeth." teething problems yeah um and it it's a bit of an academic argument because the slr which is an incredible weapon so accurate over distance but obviously fires the heavier ammunition and it's not yeah. good, it's not good in close quarter combat or around rocks and stuff because it's it's so long so long yeah but yeah. But, but you can't take anything away from that either they're just they're just Different, but in Afghanistan, what they found was when you've got an enemy that's hyped up on adrenaline or possibly substances, they'll just keep coming. And the 5.56 wasn't didn't have enough stopping power, so they went back to this. Um, I shouldn't say a really nice looking <laughs> weapon when you when you think what they're used for, but this um, short. Somebody can put in the comments, you know the weapon I'm thinking of. It was a shorter um, shorter weapon than the SLR, and it fired 7.62. And oh, right. really, I didn't know that. Yeah, really, they started to issue it to um, the uh, Special Forces Support Group and, and, and obviously the Special Forces themselves. I don't, right. think, okay. I, I don't, don't think every everybody got it. Yeah, because the SLR uh, was around for ages. Yes, yes. Like you say, I think, I th I think there seemed to be a perception that the uh, the SA eighty was somehow sort of style over content of like it was more of a design experiment than a, a functioning weapon. But I guess you know it's been stuck with it, so I guess it must have been proved. You know. Yeah, I some, don't know. Some degree. What they don't even call it the SC-18 or it's, it's Mark so many, you know, Mark one, two, three, four is probably about Mark seven now. And, um, I think they've yeah. out a lot of the problems. Um, oh, that's good. Yeah. I think one of the issues, I don't know how it is now, but you can only fire it right handed because the cocking lever is on the right side. So if you were to have it on the other side, it's going to come back and take half your face off every time you, you fire around. Right, yeah, of course. But could you imagine if you're a left-handed person and that's how you naturally align and suddenly you've got to it's, – it's a bit like throwing – trying to throw a rock with your left hand if you're right-handed. It's just – doesn't feel right. No, of course, yeah. I mean, we we know we found we found that on, on the lair, actually, like one of our actors was left-handed, but it, we weren't using SA-80s, but um, – but even then, it's like just trying to gauge everything. Most weapons are kind of fundamentally designed for right hand. 
uh, yeah, it's interesting. So what's the, um, for people that maybe wouldn't know, what, what what's the reason that a film is shot on location rather than, in this case, actually in Scotland? Uh, money, pretty much. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's like, it's, it's how much, you know, it, it costs to get a, a crew or whatever to, a specific location uh, at the time um for, with dog soldiers mm. at the time it was quite expensive to shoot in scotland and it was very cheap to shoot in luxembourg and we actually got money from the luxembourg film fund as an incentive to make you know to invite us to go there to shoot whereas like scotland was not offering anything up to say hey you know what can we do to make it easy for you guys it was like now nah, just you know this is it it's full price here Whereas half price in Luxembourg, so th that that is pretty much the only reason not to go to the actual location. Which you know, the same with uh, with the lair. It's like well, there's, obviously there's reasons not to go to Afghanistan, but um, we couldn't go to a desert country because none of them were like easy or accessible or uh, or, or cost appropriate for the film. So um, uh, Budapest offered us very good financial incentive to go there. Um, and we ended up filming in a whole bunch of like quarries and places like that to try and make it look like Afghanistan. And it and the end result is it it kind of does. So you know we we got what we wanted out of it. Um, it would have been nice to go to Morocco or Jordan or somewhere like that to film it, but uh, it, it was just too, too expensive. Yes, do you, do you know my buddy Marty Stalker by any chance? I don't know. Oh, Marty's. Um quite successful uh, producer and he funny enough he's just been in afghanistan filming a documentary they had to go in there completely uh, oh wow under, under the radar obviously being westerners and they just went in just to film the fall of you know the fall of everything that's gone on yeah uh, yeah but prior to that he made a short i think it was a short um and it was a, uh, centered on so, uh, one soldier's PTSD. And again, I think they filmed that in a quarry or somewhere. Um, you, you'd never know. No, I think I think we managed. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. That's that's the movies. It's the magic. The movies that uh, whatever's you know, whatever's in the frame, what the audience sees, that's what they take with them, and they don't get to see what's outside the frame. And quite often, uh, what's outside the frame is. It's completely different to what's inside. So, like you're falling within a quarry, but surround you is green fields or something like that. It's like, oh. but also the magic of, you know, visual effects and stuff these days. What they can do, um, you know, could pretty much do anything. So, yeah, anything's possible. Yes. Is it? I'm guessing maybe not so much if all your actors are from the same country, but I'm guessing there'd be probably quite some many visa issues moving a crew moving uh, a crew abroad. there is i mean what you tend to do is like the only you only bring in a select bunch of people like the you know uh, myself and, and the producers and maybe some of the cast most of the crew you tend to source locally um but with actors and things like that yeah depending on where they're coming from visas can be a bit of an issue i tell you what's proved difficult now is brexit is it used to be very, very simple for us to go over to Europe and make a movie. Now we have to get like all these visas and uh, I have to acquire, because I was there for three months, I had to get temporary citizenship in in Hungary, like a, a residency in there. So it's these annoying kind of paperwork and processes that you now have to go through because of Brexit. Um, but in other countries, I guess it's probably the same as it ever was anything non-european do you still keep in touch with the the cast of dog soldiers i do um not all of them some of them i've lost touch with over the years but um i'm still in touch with kevin he's out in uh, la shooting gray's anatomy like full time so mm -hmm. quite a funny the way he's ended up in a hospital drama in, in la um making his fortune out there but uh you know we're, we're in Temp we're in tentative talks at the moment for a potential Dog Soldiers sequel. Um, so that would be nice if we get to do that together. Um, I've worked with Sean a few times since. He was on The Reckoning, and um, I'm always up for working with Sean. 
Um, and some of the other guys, I think uh, Les, who played Terry, he's off. He's in Australia now. Uh, Darren Morfitt, who played Spoon, uh, he's still in London, uh, doing the odd bit here and there. Um, yeah, I always try to keep in touch with with everyone that I work with along the way. Keep uh, it, well, if it's been a good experience and good relationships and friendships have formed, then absolutely. Which for the most part is exactly what's happened throughout all my movies. So, yeah. And Lee, Liam Cunningham, he's been in a couple of your productions, hasn't he? Liam, uh, yeah, he's, Liam is an absolute legend. Um, and yeah, I, I've worked on him. I worked with him on Centurion and uh, Game of Thrones a few times. So, yeah, always a pleasure to work with Liam. Mm. Who's the chap that, uh, his name slips my mind, but great actor, played Sick Boy in Train Spotting. Uh, oh, Johnny Lee Miller. Yes, of course. Sorry, Johnny, if you ever get to watch this. Yes. <laughs> um, despite my bad memory, he's a, he is one of my sort of favourite. Um, I, was, I certainly loved him in, in Train Spotting, but he's in LA as well, isn't he? He does some. Uh, he's, he's been doing a show out in LA or New York. I think it might be in New York. Um, what's it called? It's, about, it's like a modern day Sherlock Holmes. Uh, okay. Yes. There's certainly a, um, if you can make it over there, it seems a place that people will, will stay. For TV shows and things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it can be, it's kind of like the golden handcuffs as well, though, because it's, it's, it's great. You get to do nothing but that show for God knows how many, like 10 years or something like that and make lots of money, but it doesn't allow you to do anything else. And I think that's been a little bit of Kev's frustration of, um, you know, th- th- this, this series has, has made him a lot of money and, it, you know, it's for great success. He's directing it now. He's been on it for 10 years, but because I, every time I've approached him to do something else, but he hasn't been available because of the, uh, the, the commitment to the TV series. And I think that maybe that's a little bit frustrating. Mm. How was the, the writing process? How did you, the manuscript for Dog Soldiers come about? Because you wrote it yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't write, <coughs> writing is pain. Um, it's a slow, torturous process for sure. I, it, took, it took six years to get Dog Soldiers made. So I'm writing the first draft of that script in 1996 to eventually filming it in 2001. So or 1995 to 1990, 2001. Um, it was a long, drawn-out process. I think I re- rewrote it about 18 times before we shot it. But writing like the first version of the first draft of a script is... Um, it depends. Sometimes it can be a joy. Writing Centurion was a real pleasure. I kind of wrote it in about three weeks, which never happens. Like, I just couldn't wait to just write this thing. Uh, Dog Soldiers, I think the first draft was pretty fast, but it was just refining it, refining it, refining it. Um, when you have the story very, very clear in your head, it, it, it comes a lot easier, and the characters as well. And I find those kind of characters like Centurion and like Dog Soldiers quite easy to write for. Uh, I like kind of sort of colloquial British characters that are just down to earth. And it's the kind of, it's the language I kind of know better because, you know, spent my life in the UK and sitting in pubs, listening to people, things like that. It comes more naturally than writing for say American characters or um, people I know less well. Yes. Just put a lot of F words in for British characters. It's kind of it, like just creative swearing. It's like it's like coming up with new ways to to offend people. <laughs> oh, you don't have and, to do that. I think people people offend themselves these days, don't they? Very easily, very easily. But like the English language is is, is great for for coming up with new new swears <laughs> like that. What's your thoughts then on this? Must be a kind of from an artistic perspective, a bit of a killer that when, when say TV gets a, a, a hit series yeah, and they just spin it out for another, another seven, you know, another seven series. It, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, 
Well, having having worked in both the TV and film space, I so like from the TV space, it's like, yeah, that's exactly what you want to happen. You want your TV show to last for many, many seasons and <clears throat> you know, and it's a great, you know, narr- you know, creatively and narratively, it's a great opportunity to tell a story in far far greater depth to go into detail that you can't do in a feature film when you've got seven hours or ten hours to tell a story as opposed to you know two. Um so as you know, creatively speaking, that's great. The frustrating side of it as a film director is that so many actors are now migrating to television because there's good money, good work, great roles. Um, it's like actors want to do lots of, lots of TV drama now and things like that. And it's hard to find them available to do your movie. Um, I'm finding that quite a lot, actually. A lot of the, the, lot of the cast that you want to get are all tied up for TV series and they're in, you know, contracts that mean that they they they're doing it for five years minimum, and they can't get out of it, stuff like that. So that's a little bit frustrating. But if you're in the TV world, it's like that's great. That's exactly what you want. But I would say with with television, it's like, um, especially these new, you know, the new streamers, the Amazons, the Netflix, or whatever. Uh, uh, the beast needs feeding. That uh, yes. they they need new content all the time if they want to keep people watching. They have to be making TV shows, or else they're going to shut down. Mm. So that you know, they can't just survive on repeats and reruns. Um, whereas movies, on the other hand, do not need to be made. Uh, it's nice to make them, and the world would be a, a sad place without them. But there's no essential; you know, they're not essential to a company's functioning. You know, so we make them. For, for love more than anything more than necessity um, and I think that makes it a little bit different mm. yeah, the reason I mention it is say I mean just off the top of my head something like Holby City obviously you'd want to run for 20 years because it's a it's um, it's each episode is a is a mini drama in it itself but I really loved Vikings when it came out and also Break, Breaking Bad, I think, is another example. And the cinematography in the early episodes or series was just incredible, as well as the plot. And then you find by the time it's got to uh, the seventh series, it, 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 it just felt like that they're just spinning out. What, what plot twist can we come up with now? And, and, and it, Ah, yeah. Well, some things, uh, some shows, some shows don't know when to end, and some shows do. And you know, I think the best, the best ones are like, okay, they know that they're going to go, you know, like four seasons, five seasons, or whatever it is, and then we'll tell their story, and it'll have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Something like Holby City doesn't have an end. It's it's like a soap. It's just designed to go on and on and on and on and on. Um, but like Breaking Bad or, or such like, you know, it was designed to come full circle and, and have a beginning and an end. Um, and, and, you know, you can differentiate between the two, but I, I think what else also is interesting is um, that TV has now caught up with films in terms of production value and the way they look and the way they sound and, you know, the quality is there. It used to be very, very different. You know, TV was not as good a quality as movies. Now they are. Everything's in HD, we all have our widescreen TVs and our surround sound or whatever it is. You know, we expect our TV to look as good as the movies now, and anything less won't do. Um, and I find I find that kind of very interesting. Yeah, so I hope it doesn't kill cinema because I think yeah, me too, absolutely. And I think it's always the the television has always threatened to do that. But the experience, I think, as long as they don't. Like, I worry about these day and date releases where they release it in the cinema and on digital at the same time because I think fundamentally a lot of people are quite lazy and will think, you know, I'll just stay at home and watch it rather than go out to the cinema. But what they're missing is that experience of seeing the film not only on a bigger screen with better sound and such like, but with an audience and it's a shared experience. And that's, that's the beauty of it. It's like going to a, a concert or staying home and listening to a, uh, you know, listening to a record or, you know, going to the theater. You like, you, you, you have that experience with the audience and when it's good, it's amazing. It's like, you feel 
the energy toward a film or something like that, reactions to the film, and that's, and that's what makes cinema such a great medium. Now, um, and that's what we all strive for as filmmakers. We want to give the audience that experience, especially if it's like a, a horror film or a comedy or something like that, where the audience is really getting into it. And you can hear them screaming and gasping and laughing and whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and, and, you know, I think I very much design my films to be like audience reaction films. But Dog Soldiers is very much an audience reaction film. So it was The Descent and... Um, and that's what I'm doing now. It's like I want I want to get those audible gasps and screams and laughs and whatever from whoever goes to see the movie because that yeah it means they're enjoying it more. I must be a bit antisocial because when I go to the cinema, I, I I wouldn't be happier than if I was on my own. <laughs> <laughs> I think I I do agree that there is a time and a place for like going to see a cinema. Like going, going to the cinema and watching a movie on your own and you, you really concentrate on the movie and it's a great experience and I've done that many times. Um, but it's also great with a crowd. As long as that crowd are like into the movie, they're not on their bloody telephones or they're chatting amongst themselves, then it becomes a nightmare. And it's easy for that to happen. But, you know. I have my um, sort of set routine at the cinema and I love cinema. I've always loved cinema. My, my, my gran used to take us when we were really young, weekly to see a different some some of them sort of matinees that used to come out you never heard of them but they were just such great um such great films yeah but when i go now and you got the online booking i always book the back row because i don't like <laughs> i don't want people behind me it's just like a comfort thing i, d I don't want to hear talking behind me or crisps and popcorn and stuff and i always because now age is on my uh, side i um or ages against me, I I book the the two seats down the aisle, so there's, there's no one, not just there's no one in front of me, but if I need to get up and use the toilet, I can just run down the aisle <laughs> and then run, run back up again. Um, I, I think everybody has their, their, their movie strategy, yeah. Where's the best place to sit? And if I get there and someone else is sat in my seat, I, I have no hesitation saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm normally quite quite reserved and quite polite believe it or not but in this case i'll say sorry you're in my seat <laughs> no <sighs> i think that's fair enough i think we, we, this is the thing of booking in advance and getting your tickets and your seat numbers or whatever you want you want to get that seat you want to get the best seat yeah i think um ricky gervais is in a good position isn't he because his tv dramas or, or docu comedies or whatever they're called um he just does the two series, doesn't he? Because he doesn't want it to become something that it that he doesn't want it. The you know what I'm tr tr trying to say, Neil, don't you? Well, he uh, yeah, I mean, well, he's doing the third season of um, what's it called, Afterlife. Uh, um, okay, he's doing a third season of that because it's been such a huge success for him. Um, but. I mean, he, uh, so far, anyway, he kind of like he goes in, he does something really good, and then just ends it and leaves, and does something else, and doesn't drag it on forever. You know, the office was the right length, and then he got out. You know? and the mistake was going back and doing a David Brent movie or whatever. But you know, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> oh, I really quite like that. Was it on the road, Life on the Road, or something? Uh, I think so. Yeah, but it just. I don't know. It just wasn't the same. It was like, you know, you did that, let it go. Yeah, yeah, okay. There's always that temptation, isn't there, to to um, try and just have one, just get a little bit more out of it. Yeah, I suppose so. Mm. I suppose so. Oh, well. Well, what, have your, what have been your, can we talk favourite films now? Of course. Uh, well, Okay, so the, the, the results, no matter what else changes around it, there is always a number one movie that is my favourite movie of all time and will always be my favourite movie of all time. It's the movie that inspired me to make movies. And um, so that's uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yes. Um, but around that, there'll be a whole a bunch of other movies like... Um, 
well, I, I was, you know, I grew up with Steven Spielberg in the 80s. So, like, you know, Close Encounters, Jaws, Raiders, E.T., all those movies, like, just, you know, have ingrained themselves in my soul, I think. Uh, but around that, I love movies like The Wild Bunch. I love A Bridge Too Far. I love Lawrence of Arabia. I love Heat. Um, you know, all these kind of things as well. Mm. Seven Samurai. Seven Samurai, a classic. Also, The Magnificent Seven, you know. Uh, I, I love Kurosawa movies. Uh, he's fantastic. I love, I love so many movies. It's like I, I'm I definitely am an action person. Um, more than anything, I love great, that's great action cinema. So, like the shootout in Heat is incredible. Um, things like that. There's one scene in Seven Samurai. It's the bit at the beginning where they're recruiting the warriors to go up to the village and protect the village, and and he stands behind the door in the hut and he says right when each one comes in try and smack them over the head with his stick and we'll see <laughs> their nin we'll see their nin you know their samurai skills and the first yeah. six first six come in and they're like wah and they're, they're all they're all these old ultimate ninjas and then the, the last guy comes in and he goes Poof! he goes ow why did you do that <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what great. about um first blood uh huge fan of first blood good i knew i knew you'd have my back i love first blood um i think it's, it's kind of sad what's happened to the rambo character because first blood is an incredible movie um the rest of them were like popcorn fun and or, or, or they've gone downhill like steadily as they've gone but um but the first one is just a really, really well made and, and a brilliant film. Brilliant film. Love it. Mm -hmm. I visited when I went to Canada, I visited as many of the locations as I possibly could. I kind of I do that if I'm in the area where something I love has been filmed, like I have to go and find the locations and things like that. Cause it's just 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 to be a piece of that movie, you know. There's a great um video on YouTube about somebody that they went and they um they found all the locations in first yeah. battle, all the main, main way, and it's it's yeah, the, the, funny the, the when you see them. And all that stuff. Yeah, I know it's fascinating. I've watched I think I've watched that one. Mm -hmm. Um to see the cliffs and all that stuff. And then uh because I, I I was I visited the town where they shot it and it was kind of just uh, this wasn't that long after the film was made. And I was really disappointed to find the police station didn't exist, that they built it for the film and then it's long gone now. But all the rest of the buildings are, are kind of there. So, yeah, very, very cool movie. You know, Stallone was awesome in that movie as well. Oh, it was so gritty. It was just... And, and also it was, um, it was a real change, wasn't it? Because normally, um, I think... I think when the producers first got the script, a lot of them went, hang on, what? The guy's like mentally deranged. We don't do that. We do like hero movies, every, you know. Yes. <laughs> and and I think it, um, yeah. I'm glad they, you know, because I've read the book as well and the book is pretty dark and I'm glad they didn't kill him in the end. Um, but just for that film. But yeah, I, mean, I like all that kind of gritty adventure escapism stuff. Um, yeah, it's just a, you know, and films like that, and Deliverance, uh, and uh, The Edge, um, all those kind of things uh, inspired uh, my next movie, which was which is The Descent, which is you know, people people out in the middle of nowhere and shit goes wrong. Um, but yeah, First Blood, huge inspiration. Have you seen a movie called The Professionals? You might have and to I'm talk my. I'm not talking about um, Lewis Collins and CI5. Uh, so made in the late 60s, a film with Lee Marvin and Burt Lancaster called The Professionals, about a bunch of mercenaries who go into Mexico uh, to kidnap Claudia Cardinal. And um, it's just one of the great kind of um, mercenary movies. It's, it's just awesome. It's a really good, it's great dialogue and great action and stuff like that. I think you might like it. Yeah, I, I've probably seen it. Just my my memory isn't what it used to be. Um, the first blood's funny because my poor son he's only six, but he get I forced all the eighties and nineties movies onto him. Got to be uh, done. Well, 
we i mean it's, it was my birthday yesterday so we we just watched rocky three uh, we, 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 we've got the whole series and yeah i don't know if that's appropriate for six show but he does go to taekwondo so he does kind of you know get the whole the, the whole fight thing i'm banned from showing him first blood at this moment in time which okay yeah you, you got to take a hit sometimes i think so but i think you know once he gets to like nine ten, that's the time to show it to him yeah i mean that's kind of the age that like most of my a lot of my favorite films i saw around between like nine and eleven like boom just that period of time uh and i think first blood was around then as well things like yes. that raiders was definitely around then uh yeah that's the time i remember showing him e et and i think the first time around you think he was too young i just it just didn't didn't get it but um we have watched it subsequently mm -hmm. And now, when we watch it the other day, we've had one of the stunt riders on the show. Oh, cool. Yeah, Robert Cardoza. He's a very wonderful gentleman. And he was, um, he rocked up on a set with Steven Spielberg. And his, his job was just to take these bikes, the, the Kuaras or Kuaharas. Yeah, yeah. This, this phenomenal BMX bike that the world had, had yet to really see or well, certainly in england we had and when he got on set um steven spielberg saying yeah we've got this great stunt guy and the, the guy promptly like fell off his bike <laughs> and, and uh <laughs> robert said to him that's like that's he's a stuntman but he's not a bmxer i'm a bmxer do you want me to show you and and uh so he he promptly jumped over steven spielberg's porsche <laughs> <laughs> and um, he said yeah i can get all the guys to come on board and do all the um stunt work so bob bob harrow that was a very famous name from the bmx era um yeah he's in it and uh yeah we had robert on the show the other day and it's it's a wee bit of a shame to me that stuff like that to me it's just legend it's just you know, when am I ever going to get to chat to someone who was in ET for crying out loud? And they did the BMX scene, which is just any '80s kid favorite scene. It's, a, um, it's very, it's yeah, it's very, very cool, very cool. Mm. Yeah, that these are things that are like iconic. Like you know, like he was one of the guys kids on the BMX. It's brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. But I think I'm kind of on my own in my like sometimes because <laughs> our audience doesn't seem to pick up on it i don't know if that's an age thing or 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 um or what it is have, have you ever seen it's all gone pete tom i have not no uh is it is it paul paul k he's quite a, uh, a british actor very yeah. funny yeah paul k he he used to be um dennis penis he, yes on that yes. saturday night that funny saturday night show was it let me just let me just check i've got his yeah yeah Dennis Pennis, that's yeah that's paul k he plays this dj in ibifa that that loses his hearing and then goes through the mill with with the cocaine and stuff and then it, it's just ah probably because a lot of it mirrors my life it it's um it's just what one it is it is so so it's just one of those films something it's got so many one-liners in that it's, um i, I know of it i just yeah i know of it i just haven't checked it out but i'll check it out for sure he's there and he's deaf and he says it was almost great to hear that <laughs> 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 and the funny thing was paul paul k a, a, a if his interviews are to be believed he never was into like the rave scene or anything he just said he was a hardcore drinker back in the day and and yet he plays this you know ibiza dj just perfectly or certainly the kind of caricature of what yeah. what, what 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 we'd think um yes oh cool no i definitely i, I like your good recommendation so i'll check it out yeah you know it, it's it's good but it is also that thing isn't it that what what is art to someone and what's enjoyable to one person can be 
you can just go over someone else's head. Well, just... that, that's that's both the beauty and the pain of it. That, 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 that is, that's, that's what makes it great, but it also makes it painful sometimes. But because you were involved in Hell, Hellboy, the well, that's the pain side. Yeah, <laughs> I was. Yeah, what? Sorry, were you the a producer in that? Uh, no, no, I directed it. So, sorry, director. For, for my sins. Yes. Nah, oh. That was just that was just a mistake all around, really. It was just um it was a terrible script and a terrible idea. And uh I was I was lured in for all the wrong reasons of a bit of cash, but mainly because I hadn't made a feature film in like nine years and was so hungry to make another feature film. Uh, that when this one presented itself, I kind of jumped at the chance without sort of stopping to 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 notice just how bad the whole thing was, and uh, I don't know, kind of blustered my way through it. But yeah, you, know, you can't polish a turd, as they say. Was um, it that bad? I, I'm I've got this thing that I really like real life, so I like stuff that could actually be real. Give give or take, you know, a, a plot twist or whatever. Yeah, well, it's not remotely like that. Mm. It's completely fantastical. There's nothing Based grounded on a Mar- in it at Mar- all. Marvel comic was it? It's not Marvel. Um, it's uh, but it is based on a on a series of graphic novels. Yeah, yeah. I could never get into that stuff. Um, Me neither. I- uh, you know, I did. I I I you know, I, I jumped into Hellboy and prep for the movie. But uh, as a kid, I was never into comics or anything like that. It's like not my scene. It was all it was all movies for me, just movies. Yeah, I was exactly the same. I used to like reading adventure books and you know stuff, yeah. stuff that could actually be real. So I don't really my 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 girlfriend loves all that stuff. She grew up with Marvel and you know the Avengers yeah. and all this sort of stuff. And I, I just didn't really en- didn't really encounter that. I think a lot of people, you know, so much of what I like was inspired by my dad and stuff like that. So survival stuff, adventure stuff. Outdoors stuff, military stuff, things like that was what I kind of grew up on. So the Facebook Revenant. and things like that, perfect. The Revenant, is it? Yeah. Yeah, that was Leonardo DiCaprio, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you, have you got this thing? My my girlfriend hates watching a film with me because I am one of those people that goes, well, that wouldn't happen. and they. Because I'm an author, I can see where they've stitched stuff together. That yeah, you know, I tend that. not. To, I I tend not to. I'll think about these things, but I'll tend to keep it to myself. Mm. Uh, watching a movie or whatever, but uh, yeah, I, I I I try not to be that guy who's like, oh, that's just yeah, no, that that, yeah. that, that wouldn't happen. That would, yeah, but I'm thinking it. <laughs> I try not. I try not to be it, but apparently I am. <laughs> apparently I am. <laughs> Oh, I think actually, to be honest, it can't. It, it's not so much with films and stuff. It's more. I, I, I've got to be careful. I can't drop any names in here, but there's certain survival programs, right, that are so ridiculously fabricated, and I don't. Uh, you said you like survival yourself. I've always read, you know, like the SAS. Survival manual. I think Lofty Wiseman were trying to get Lofty on the on on the show for a while. I've been been chatting to him and uh-huh. loved all that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, I I've got this thing that I don't like being lied to. I don't mind if someone says, "Look, you know, in a real situation, you're probably never going to catch a rabbit unless you're really really lucky and your skills. You know, you've lived in the in in the nature your whole life so for the purposes of exercise we bought these ones from a pet shop <laughs> maybe, maybe right. a pet shop i don't <laughs> mind i like that sort of approach but i don't like this constant lying to the kids this giving them this false um idea of what it is to be a man or, or, or what it is to survive yeah no i think that's fair that's fair enough because some of them make it look like survival is kind of a walk in the park like like oh yeah just go up find this eat this find that eat that like yeah it's, it's not that easy <laughs> no no so let's talk about the lair then um how did this come about 
Um, well, I, I just done a film called The Reckoning. Um, I, weirdly, I, I shot it in 2019, um, and it's a and it deals with the plague. Um, and of course, it came out in 2020. So it's like we had no idea what was going to happen in 2020. But there was a film we made a film about a plague, um, and then um, off the back of that. Uh, I wanted to make more of a so it, 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 that was a horror film, but it's kind of very gothic and slightly drama and 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 more sort of esoteric. And then uh, I came off the back of that wanting to make much more of a kind of old school blood and guts action horror film like Dog Soldiers, like The Descent, like I started out making, and um, had this idea of this, this something going on in Afghanistan, or whatever. Um, because of the Russians and things like that. So I had, had all these ideas brewing and uh, it seemed like at the time, because I wrote it, you know, during COVID uh, and lockdown and stuff like that was like, is it a film that I could make under those circumstances? Because I knew that certain films were getting made, but it was, help, it was helpful if it was like a small group of people, a few locations and maybe somewhere like hot and sunny to go out and work in. So I was like, that's where the desert sort of setting came from. Um, and so, yeah, so I wrote, wrote the lair and got it was soldiers and explosions and guns and monsters and things like that. Just a lot of fun. Just wanted to, ha to make a fun movie. And um, yeah, so that, so I wrote that 2020 and um, managed to, you know, get the money together to shoot it this year. Um, it all came together very, very quickly. And this is Charlotte Kirk. I'm just looking at the other screen now. So, yeah, so Charlotte is my co-creator and partner in crime, and she's also the, the lead in the movie because she was the lead in The Reckoning as well. She's my muse. Yeah. It's, do, you, do you, Have you guys got some sort of synergy going on then? Oh, definitely. Um, well, we're engaged for a start, so we've <laughs> definitely got some synergy going on. Oh, bloody hope but, so, yeah. But uh, but creatively, um, like she comes much more from a dramatic kind of acting background, and I come from sort of you know monster movies and directing and such like. And we kind of meet in the middle somewhere. Like so, a lot of the ideas that she throws into these things is very left field for me, but they make a lot of sense, you know, and it's, it's very character based sort of stuff. <laughs> So it kind of we we meet in the middle and, and and bounce ideas backwards and forwards and it works really really well. Yes, because it's hard, isn't it, to find somebody that has your vision? Yes, it's very difficult. But um, but I think early on we kind of we could we could tell we were into the same kind of things and, and movies and things like that. So we like we you know she's a huge fan of John Carpenter's The Thing and Aliens. And The Shining and stuff like that, and it was like, okay, these these are all some of my favorite movies as well. And these are the kind of things that we were aspiring to. So you know, the lair we wanted to sort of make something akin to Aliens that would like leave people as shell shocked as as that did when when I first saw it. When when will it be released? Um, we'll finish it around about January February, and then hopefully we'll be released late that year. Mm. Is it um, it what or what? What are the biggest headaches then when you're on set or you're or you're trying to get something like this? This to, I mean, obviously it's different whether you're producing or directing or or writing. Yeah. But can you give us a few ideas for those of us that have never? The biggest problem is always never having enough time. Um, we had. 30 days to shoot it, which sounds like a lot. Um, but when you try to do an action film and it, that, that's a lot, to, you know, when, when, like a Marvel movie or something like that, they'll still have like 200 days to shoot something like that. So, you know, or more, you know, so, so the, the, uh, even something like Raiders of the Lost Ark had 75 days to shoot it. So we had 30 days, which to try and do something like that is not easy when you need to get when you're dealing with a lot of action you're dealing with dangerous stuff such as stunts explosives uh firearms uh you know we were lucky enough to get to use blank firing weapons which um 
it's not that common for a low budget movie. Like a lot of them nowadays, it's like they use uh, what are they called? Um, they replica guns, but they like fire little ball bearings, but you, they don't fire them in the film. They just pull the trigger and click, click, click. Mm-hmm. Um, and afterwards, they add in the, the sound effect and the the, fl- the muzzle flash. Um, but you can tell because the actors aren't. There's no kickback to it. There's no recoil, and there's no the muzzle flash doesn't give off any interactive lighting around them. Um, whereas using blank firing weapons, we got you know the, the actors felt it, it allowed them to be more authentic in like handling the weapons because they're dangerous. Whereas the plastic ones are not, um, and just getting them to respect the weapons and you know, respect how they handle them and such like, I think this is really really important. Um, and then the actual interaction with the weapon when it's firing um, all just makes it look more gritty and realistic. And that's key to the kind of things that I want to do. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we had a fairly small cast, like 10 people total and some tricky locations, some very unpleasant locations. <laughs> um, but it's just time. You're just, just waiting to do as much as possible in the shortest amount of time. And that's not always tricky. Mm. and you can't like shout and scream at people i'm not interested in doing that and nobody wants to work for somebody who's going to shout and scream at them um so it's just trying to you know keep people excited and enthused and motivated and keep them going yes i can tell you another one of my pet hates now then it's um it's not a pet hate i, I, I it just amazes me that <clears throat> Hollywood will spend X amount of million dollars on a film and no one has told the actor you, you don't shut your eyes when you fire a, <laughs> when you fire a weapon it's is yeah that something you've come across oh d- well definitely I think I, th- I think it's, it's really difficult for people who like they've only had a couple of days practice or whatever that to get used to it um I know Charlotte blinked a few times when she was firing. No, she didn't shut her eyes, but she, you know, blinked. I, but he, I, Mel, I know Mel Gibson's kind of famous for it. That he can't not blink when he fires a weapon, um, and I think a lot of actors do. But yeah, that's it, kind of interesting. I think some were fine, some blinked, but like I said, nobody was like holding their eyes shut when they were firing. There was nothing like that going on. Mm. You know, we tried, we tried to keep it as realistic as we could. <laughs> Did you have to get um, actors to play l- local Afghans? Uh, we did. Uh, we actually found uh, a couple of local guys um, of Afghan origin to play the Afghans. Some of the others are like stuntmen in heavy disguise, but uh, for anybody who features, um, you know, we, we got some uh, authentic actors for the roles. Mm. And Neil, it's been absolutely wonderful chatting is there anything you'd like to um if you, you'd like to promote or add um uh not at the moment i mean and you know the layer is coming out till next year so i mean people just look out for that that'd be great and uh yeah oh, and one last thing we should talk about did you do some episodes of westworld i did an episode of westworld yes how was that I, well it was it was the opportunity to do a western for one um i never had a chance to do a western before i got to do some shootouts and things like that which was great fun i got to work with ed harris which is great but mainly i got to work with anthony hopkins i got to direct hopkins which is like ah you know a legend mm-hmm. so yeah it was it was a blast do you I'm, I'm guessing you you saw the original western oh yes film. i love the original movie uh, uh and i've i've because my episode was in season one of this, the TV show, but I, I'm afraid I have not watched the, the, the other two seasons yet. Um, just haven't got around to it. Yeah, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. We, I think we watched the first season, because I was obviously a big fan of the original film with Yul Brynner. Um, and I don't know that... It, it did get to a point where it just got really technical yeah, and involved. Well, it was quite technical anyway, but I couldn't see, as a concept, I couldn't really see how it could 
sustain itself as a story as to where it was going to go into the wider world. You know, that the Westworld concept would basically burn out in the first season because they'd have to expand it. And then you kind of forget about the fact that it was Westworld, which was the whole point in the first place. So I don't know. I need to at least check out the other two seasons and see what it's, see what it's like. Hey, I'm available if you, um, I'll, I'll, I can always s- s- squeeze in a shooting in my calendar, mate. If, if, we, uh, if we need any uh, military advisors or anything like that. That'd be good. Well, I've just landed my first film role um, with the wonderful Martin Webster, uh-huh. who, who's just released Penitent. Um, Great. Which is a, Congratulations. A, 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 it's a lovely little film shot on incredibly low budget, uh-huh. but it's been winning awards. So um, good on, good on Martin. But yeah, no, he's, just, he's just offered me a, I'm going to guess it's probably more of a cameo in his latest. Are you, are, you, are you itching to get in front of the camera? Is that it? No, Neil, I'm one of these people that if I had a little role in a film, I'd be so happy for the rest of my life. I, you know, just I just fancy giving it a try and seeing, yeah, just yeah, try a bit of everything. I don't really even care what it, what it is. I'm not out to, you know, I don't want to, be the next Brad Pitt or anything, although a lot of people will obviously make make that mistake. <laughs> um, no, it's just that when I was a little boy, I just dreamed of things, you know? Mm-hmm. Like I dreamed of diving off the cliff at, at Acapulco when I saw the Elvis movie. And then as an adult, I'm in Acapulco. What am I going to do? I'm, I'm swimming across that lagoon, climbing up the cliff, and I'm, I'm diving off. Not... Not from the top, folks. It's forty-two meters high, but that's pretty high. But it's it's silly little things like that. I mean, I've caught piranhas in the Amazon because of the books, the books that I read when I was a teenager were, you know, people. I read about people catching piranhas in the Amazon, and there's this fish, and it can eat a horse or something. And um, I mean, obviously, writing a book is quite a quite a nice thing to. Adjust to achieve um and now i i tick my little thing every day because i get to speak to wonderful talented people like yourself neil um so just to have a little role in a film i don't care what it is that's i'll be very happy about that all right i will keep that in mind for yeah. sure yeah well i'm sorry i wasn't putting the pressure on you but martin, no, no, no. martin has my, now offered me something so um that's that's great my, my only thing is that i like i'd love to shoot something in the uk again i haven't shot in the uk for a long time so i'd like to do that and then there's a whole bunch of people i want to get in like cameo roles and stuff so i'll have yeah. to send you a copy of my memoir eating smoke um i've been approached by is it is it William Morris is the biggest agency in Hollywood or yes. one of the yeah yeah yeah. I've, yeah I've been approached now by Hollywood about ten times for the rights to uh, 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 where is it my first memoir eating smoke oh cool one man's, one man's descent into crystal meth psychosis in Hong Kong's triad heartland wow. Um, and nothing, nothing ever, ever came of it. Um, but I spoke to the wonderful Lyle Howery the other day, who's also a, um, a producer. He's over there in in um, Hollywood, and he said, "Yeah, send send it across, Chris." But the way I explained it to Lyle is, <sighs> there was a time when you had classic films. Do you remember Midnight Express? Yes. Just, oh, my God. And it seems now that Hollywood just shy away from that, from just creating classics, and they stick with the kind of tried and tested, you know, comic they do. And, and this sort of stuff. But but Eating yeah. Smoke would, would be, um, it just would make, it would just be great on the screen, I think. It might be... Um, it might need a sort of Danny Boyle take on it because um, yeah, of the psychos- yeah. psychosis aspect. But um, yes. 
No, it sounds like good subject matter. So, like, I can't believe like somebody like a uh, an Amazon or something like that isn't trying to you know do it. Yes, I'll um I'll ping you a copy. <laughs> Can you tell me what? Yeah, yes, doing? yes, please. Thank you. No, thank you, Neil. Um, it's just been an absolutely wonderful chat, and I get to ask all the things that are in my my, my head. Um, <laughs> I wish you all the best with the lair. Cheers. And I can't wait to, um, yeah, can't wait to see it. And, can't wait uh, to show it to people. Yeah, and feel free to come on the show again and, and when it comes out and let us know how it's going. All right, yes, thank you. So stay on the line so I can thank you properly when I hit the record off. Um, but to our friends at home, massive love to you all. Thank you for continuing to support the channel. I hope you love this chat as much as I did. If you can like and subscribe, that will be legendary. And we'll see you next time.